Hi again, we are uh, now starting chapter 13, which is uh, vector functions, and we're going to do a lot of things with uh, calculus, with uh, integrals, derivatives, limits, uh, some of the stuff that we haven't really been focusing on in the past chapter or so. And so we're going to get back into doing some Cal 1, Cal 2 topics uh, doing vectors. So what is a vector value function? Well, it's also called a vector function, but it's simply any function that maps a set of real numbers to a set of vectors. And we're primarily going to work in three dimensions, uh, and that's mainly because that's what you'll see when you get into Cal 4 as well. So you could write a vector function as uh, either the ijk notation, where we have a function of t times the vector i, a function of t times the vector j, and a function of t times the vector k, or you could take each one of those vector uh, function, those uh, uh, functions of t and put it into our other uh, notation for vectors. And so your f, g, and h are real valued component functions for the vector r. And we can do things with them. Uh, just like what we did back in Cal 1, we could do limits, we could do derivatives, we could do integrals, we could do all sorts of stuff. And so this first box says that if you wanted to take the limit of a vector valued function, you would just literally do the limit of each piece along the way, which is really great. Limits are linear operators, so they work very well to do that. And so hopefully that's not going to be too bad. So let's try one. Find the limit of each one of these things. So if I want to do the limit as t approaches 0 of this vector valued function e to the negative 3ti plus t squared over sine squared tj plus cosine 2tk, I literally just have to do the limit of each one. So I'm going to kind of do this on the side. I'm going to do the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the negative 3t. Then I'm also going to do the limit as t approaches 0 of t squared over sine squared t. And then I'll do the limit as t approaches 0 of cosine 2t. Some of these are really easy, though. Uh, the e to the negative 3t. I can just plug 0 into that. That's really easy to do. And so this would be e to the negative 3 times 0, which is just e to the 0 is 1. So that limit would be 1. The second one I can't do that with, because if I plug 0 into t squared, I'll get 0 squared, which is 0. On the bottom, I would get sine of 0, which is 0 squared is 0. So plugging in 0 on the top and the bottom will give me 0 over 0. So that means I have to do something else, either some sort of simplifying, or in this case, I could do uh, L'Hopital's rule would work from Cal 2. So I could do by L'Hopital's rule that this is the limit as t goes to in 0 of 2t over uh, sine squared. I would pull power down, subtract 1 from the power, and then do the derivative of the inside, which is cosine. So my t, my twos actually cancel. Or you could leave them in there. It doesn't really matter. If you cancel them, you'll get that this is the limit as t approaches zero of t over sine t cosine t, and you're back at the same spot. If I plug zero into that, I'll get zero on top. On the bottom, because I have sine of t. I get sine of 0, which is 0, so I have to do another L'Hopital's rule. So on the top, I'll get 1. On the bottom, that's a product rule. Uh, sine, derivative, uh, first time through the second would go to negative sine. Uh, and then the second time through the first uh, would go to cosine as well. Now, here you'd have to notice something. Uh, well, you don't have to notice it. You could have noticed it. You could have also noticed it uh, a couple of steps ago. The 2 times sine times cosine, that would have been uh, an identity. This cosine times cosine is cosine squared. Sine times sine is sine squared. So this is cosine squared minus sine squared, which is also an identity. If you don't notice it, it's not that big of a deal. This is the limit 
as t goes to 0 of 1 over cosine squared minus sine squared. Uh, if you do notice it's an identity, you're welcome to do it. But if you plug 0 in, I'll get 1 over cosine of 0 is 1 and sine of 0 is 0. So you get 1 over 1 squared, which is 1. That's a lot of work for a 1, especially when we got 1 on the first one and we didn't do nearly that much work. And on the third one, you won't do that much work either. Uh, if I plug in 0, I get cosine of 0, which is 1. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. Uh, and so my limit of this thing would be 1i plus 1j plus 1k. And that would be my answer. Hopefully you remember limits a little bit. Okay, let's talk about a space curve. So suppose that you have the three functions, the f, g, and the h. They are the same t real valued uh, functions, then the set of all the c points x, y, z that make that f of t, g of t, h of t in space is called a space curve. And so one special type of space curve is the helix. This is the helix over here, where we could draw out a cylinder like what we would have done in the previous section in 12.6 draw out a cylinder, and then map the points around the outside of that cylinder. And that pink line going around the cylinder, that is your space curve creating your helix. But a space curve could be any type of spiral or shape that's just riding along in space. It's not a straight line. It's very, much, very, very much like what we would have done with parametric equations back in 10.1. Those parametric equations in 10.1 were two space, two two dimensional. Now we're just taking those parametric type equations and moving them into three space. So this kind of plays off um, off all the info that we had from uh, ten point one and ten point two on parametric equations. So a lot of this will kind of look like what we were doing back then. So this says sketch the curve with the given uh, vector equation and indicate the arrow, just like what we would have done when we did a parametric equation, with the direction in which the t moves. And so this is a two-dimensional type graph. And so it's two-dimensional because there's only a uh, two different functions here. So I'm going to go off of the just a two-dimensional type thing here. And remember, back what we did a long time ago is that we had a t and an x and a y. You might remember that from back in 10.1. So like, for instance, if I put 0 in there, sine of 0 is 0, and if you plug 0 in, you just get 0. And I'm going to pick values of something with a pi in it. Like, for instance, if I went to um, pi over 4. Well, the y value would be pi over 4. But the x value would be sine of pi over 4, which is root 2 over 2. Or if I went to pi over 2, the y value would be pi over 2. But the x value would be sine of pi over 2, which is 1. And you could keep going. So we're starting at uh, the x value would be 0, 0. The y value would go to uh, pi over 4, pi over 2, pi. Uh, they're not spaced out correctly, but that's okay. Uh, at pi over 4 for the y's, your x's were at root 2 over 2, which is about eh, 0 0.707. And then it goes up to 1. Oh, I didn't plug in pi, did I? Well, if you plug in pi, sine of pi is 0, so we got to get back down to the x's. Basically, what's going to happen is you're going to end up making the sine graph turn sideways. Going upward. And that would be your two, two dimension, uh, very much like what we would have done back in your parametric equations from a long time ago. 
we could extend this into a three-dimensional shape. So I want to show you one of those. So sketch the curve, uh, indicate with an arrow which way it's moving. So now we have not just a X and a Y, but we actually have an X, Y, and a Z. So just like on the last one, I'm going to make an X. Well, let me put the T on there too. X, Y, Z. And I just pick, plug in different values. Like if I start with 0. When T is 0, X and T are the same thing. So that's just 0. Y is 2 minus T, which is 2 minus 0, which is 2. And Z is 0 times 2, which is 0. Or maybe you'll plug in 1. X and, y, X and T are the same thing. Y would be 2 minus 1, which is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. If I plug in 2, I'll get 2, 0, 4. And you can keep going as many points as you want to plot. If you plug in 3, you'll get 3, negative 1, and 6. But your points are these three on this side. And so now we have to draw this out and what this would look like. So here's my x-axis, my y-axis, and my z-axis. I'm starting at the point 0, 2, 0. So let's put some little tick marks on here. We'll go out to 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Going up. And so uh, 0, 2, 0 means not left or right on the x, but you go out to 2 on the y. And then that's it. When t is 1, we go out to 1 on the x, out to 1 on the y, and up to 2 on the z. So you have to go out this way, out this way, and then up to 2. Then we might go to 2, 0, and then up to 4. So we got to go up to 4. And then we got to go to 3, negative 1. So you got to go backwards to negative 1. And up to 6. So we'll end up with a graph that kind of goes up this way. And it... Uh, it would be straight. That's a terribly not straight line. But that, it should be straight because each one of these terms is a linear term. So this is actually a straight uh, line in this case. Okay. Find a vector equation and parametric equations for the line segment that joins points P and Q. This is the same thing that we were talking about back in 12.5. You have two points, and we can find the line segment that joins them by the formula that we talked about back then. And just in case you don't remember that formula, your formula was a vector equation. That's why they kind of bring this topic uh, back up in this section. So we had a t minus 1 times a vector r naught plus t times a vector r1. Hopefully you remember that. So I need two different uh, vectors to work with. So in this case, since these uh, points is what I'm trying to join together, what I could do is treat each one of them as a vector itself. So I could say that, um, for instance, r naught or r sub 0, I could do the vector negative 1, 2, negative 2. And the r1 be the vector negative 3, 5, and 1. So I could treat those points as vectors themselves and just plug them in and see what I get. So my vector equation for r t, 
I would have t minus 1 times r naught, which is negative 1, 2, negative 2, plus t times negative 3, 5, 1. And so remember, we kind of gathered some terms together along the way. Uh, I would do 1 times each one of those in the first vector. So that would be just negative 1, 2, and negative 2. Then I would do a negative t or positive t, whichever one you want to. I'll do the negative t. If I do negative t on each one, I'll have a t, a negative 2t, and a positive 2t. And then I would do the negative 3t, 5t, and t on the last one. And then to put them all together in one thing, I'd have a negative 3t and a positive 1t would give me a negative 2t minus 1 for the first term. Then I have a 5t minus 2t is 3t plus 2. And then t and 2t makes 3t minus 2. That would be my vector equation for my line segment as long as if you might remember the stipulation from back in 12.5, uh, that was B for T's between 0 and 1. The parametric equations would just be each one of those individually. Your X would be negative 2T minus 1. Your Y would be 3T plus 2. And your Z would be 3, uh, sorry, 3T minus 2. So that's your parametric this is your vector equation. And hopefully that's just you know something you might already remember from 12.5. Okay, this one says sketch out this graph. This is a uh, vector equation given in parametric form. Uh, is, x equals t cosine t, uh, y equals t, and z equals t sine t. This would be the same sort of thing if you wrote it in a vector equation like this. So whichever way is better for you. So if I sketch this out, what does that look like? Well, again, you could just plot some points if you wanted to. Uh, you could end up with, uh, starting since we're going bigger than or equal to zero, we could do a t, an x, a y, and a z. And plug some numbers in, starting with zero. If t is zero, then I get zero times cosine zero. Well, zero times pretty much anything is zero. Uh, the y value and the t value are always the same. And sine of zero is zero as well, so you get the origin to begin with. Uh, since it is sines and cosines, it might be good to pick values that are bigger than zero that are uh, on the unit circle. That might be helpful. And so let's do things like pi over two. Well, cosine pi over two is zero. Y value is always the same thing as the T value. Sine of pi over zero is one. So you get one times pi over two, which is pi over two. Or if you plug in pi, cosine pi is negative one. So I have to get negative pi. Then I'll get pi and I'll get um, sine of pi is zero. So I get zero. And so you can keep going and make as many points as you want to. What is gonna be happening here though is we'll end up with a graph, if I can kind of draw this out. This, again, my drawings are awful, so hopefully this will make a little bit of sense. You're starting at the origin, zero, zero. We're not moving out on the x-axis, but we are moving out on the y-axis and the z-axis, pi over two. So if I mark these off in pi over twos, So each one of these is pi over 2 or pi for every, one, every other one. Uh, as I go out to pi over 2 for my t, I don't go anywhere on the x-axis, but I go out and up 
on the axis on the y. But when t is pi, I go to negative pi, which would be going back this way. And I go up to pi. On the out the pi, I'm sorry, on the y axis. But my z axis ends up being zero, so I'm actually in the graph here. Uh, it might be good to do a couple more just to kind of show you what's going to happen. If we went to 3 pi over 2, uh, cosine 3 pi over 2 would also be 0. I'd go out to 3 pi over 2 on the y-axis, and sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so I get negative 3 pi over 2. And I'm going to go all the way out to 2 pi just to show you what happens. If you go to 2 pi, sine, uh, cosine of 2 pi is 1, so I just get 2 pi. The y value is always the same as the t, and sine of 2 pi is 0. So the next one after that, when I get to 3 pi over 2, I don't go out any on the x-axis, but I go out to 3 pi over 2 on the y-axis, and then down to 3 pi over 2 on the z-axis. So I've got to go down here somewhere. So I'm actually down below. And then uh, 2 pi, I go out to 2 pi on the x-axis, and then out to 2 pi on the y-axis. You're actually getting a spiral that's coming around, that's spiraling out if you were to keep going. The crazy thing about it is, if you were to notice, we'll actually end up with a, see if I can draw this kind of out, you actually end up with a cone coming out and this blue line is actually going around that cone that's what we're that's where we're that's what it's aiming to be is a cone with the the shape going around the outside around the y-axis for instance if i took my graph up there at the top my original equations and i squared them if I did x squared, I'd have t squared cosine squared. If I did y uh, squared, I'd have, oops, I'd have t squared. And if I had z squared, I'd have t squared sine squared. Now, remember, on your cone, when we talked about cones in the last section, if we have uh, a single variable squared equal to another variable squared and another variable squared added, uh, that's the definition of a cone. Well, if I did the t squared, would that equal the other two added together? And it would, because the t squared would be uh, able to be factored out. And so I get that t squared equals t squared. So yes, I could actually rewrite this equation as y squared equals uh, x squared plus z squared. This is a cone. And so what we're getting is this curve going around the outside of a cone. If that helps as well. It doesn't really matter which one you do. Uh, plotting the points is usually the best for most people, but that's actually what's going on. You're getting the cone shape from the quadrant surfaces and that, that graph, that space curve is just going around the outside of that graph. Okay, at what points does the, the vector uh, function intersect the paraboloid? That's what we're going to be looking at next. So, uh, here are vector function from up here at the top. This vector function tells us some stuff. It tells us that our x is t. It tells us our y must be 0 because there is no j component 
and it tells us that our z must be 2t minus t squared. So I get that from the, the vector function. So I have an equation that z equals x squared uh, plus y squared. So I could just take all three of these pieces and plug them in and see what I get. So if I plug them in, I'll end up with 2t minus t squared. That's your z value. Then I'll get x squared, which is t squared, and y squared, which is 0 squared. So I'll get 2t minus t squared equals t squared. <laughs> How boring is that, right? Well, if you move them to the same side, I'm going to move uh, these terms this direction. I'll get that 0 equals 2t squared minus 2t. Or, back of the 2t out, you'll get t minus 1. So either t is 0 or t is 1. Plug those in for the, the x, y, and the z. Plug these terms back into over here. And I will get two different points. If I plug 0 in, I'll get the point 0, 0, and 0. That's when t is 0. And if you plug in 1, you'll get the point 1, 0, and 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1. And that would be your two points where they would intersect. Okay, how about one last problem? Find a vector function that represents the curve of intersection of the two surfaces. So we have a cylinder. This comes from uh, what we talked about in 12.6. This is actually a circle with radius of 2. Notice there's no z term there, so we are going around the z axis with infinitely many circles, and so that's going to make our, our cylinder like what we talked about in 12.2. So we want to figure out where that intersects this surface of z equals xy. Well, one thing we can notice is that since it is a circle, we might remember from a while back that sine squared and cosine squared equals 1. If I let the x and the y be the cosine and the sine, then I could say this is actually cosine squared, or actually because of the 4 on there, since it's equal to 4 instead of 1, you're actually going to do uh, 2 cosine t squared plus 2 sine t squared. That would be 4. That way, cosine squared plus sine squared would be 1, and then you'd have the, the 4s left over that would be factored out. So that would work. And so now I have that the 2 cosine t and the y would be 2 sine t. And what is z? Well, z is xy from up here. If they're going to intersect, they have to be the same thing. So I'm going to use the xy for the z. And so my x is the 2 cosine t, and the y is the 2 sine t, or that's 4 sine cosine. Now there's an identity there as well, so we could make that be, if you wanted to, this is the same thing as 2 uh, sine 2t. Two now, one thing to keep in mind here is that we are not actually solving for a specific t. We are solving for a vector function. And so the vector function we're going to use is, I know this is an x value, this is a y value, and this is a z value. And so my, my intersection 
would be a vector function represented by 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, and 2 sine 2t. This function is my intersection. Remember, in 3 space, you may not end up having an intersection of a single point, but you could have an entire function be an intersection. And that's what we have here. This cylinder from the x squared plus y squared equals 4, you have this infinitely long cylinder, or infinitely long, uh, tall cylinder since it's going on the z-axis, uh, and you have a surface that intersects it. And so when it intersects that cylinder, you'll get a graph of, of some sort. And so that's why we end up with a uh, 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, and 2 sine 2t. So hopefully that makes some sense. That's the end of se uh, section 13.1. And so we have just a few more sections to go.